How's it going guys? My name is Tavarish and today I'm going to ask you a very simple question. Why do you love cars? What about an automobile do you consider desirable? Well, if you ask social media, then a car has to cost a billion dollars and do zero to 800 miles an hour faster than you can say its name. But for me, none of that matters. You see, I've been asking that question of myself and I've been coming back to one car over and over and over again. You can forget Zondas, you can forget Koenigseggs. Only one car was my money, no object, ultimate dream car. And today, <laughs> I can't believe I'm saying this, I bought it. So if you guys are new to my channel, feel free to take a look around. And if you like what you see, consider subscribing and hit that bell because if this car is anything to go by, this channel is gonna have some very interesting things coming up in the future. This is a 2009 Aston Martin DBS, and in my opinion, it is the most beautiful car on earth made in the last 20 years. Now, before I get too deep into this thing, I should probably tell you how I got it. Now, those of you who aren't new to my channel will know that several months ago, Tyler Hoover, Ed Bolian, and I, we started this Top Gear-esque style show called Car Trek. And Car Trek was a lot of fun. The first series was basically us taking these exotic depreciated supercars and pitting them in a series of challenges. My car in that series was a 2015 Aston Martin V12 Vantage S. And I love the car. And more importantly, I showed you guys that I love the Aston Martin brand. It had been my favorite automaker for more than a decade. I had so much fun during filming and hopefully you saw that and had fun as well. Now, for us to do this again, we need to make sure that as many people see it as possible. So I'm gonna ask you for a favor, you specifically. In the description below is the Series 1 Car Trek playlist. If you haven't checked it out, then please do. I think you'll really like it. And if you have, then feel free to watch it again, watch it with family, share it with a friend. The more views we get, the more likely it is that we're gonna be able to do another one of these things. But speaking of that, I'm recording this video right after we wrapped Series 2 of Car Trek. And if you want a sneak peek of that, then Check that out. So that is a car from Car Trek 2. I'm not giving away anything else. If you want spoilers, you're gonna have to go to my Instagram, but stay tuned because Car Trek Series 2 is coming to this channel next month. Now after Car Trek, it's a little uh, slick. Now after Car Trek finished filming, I had to list my car for sale on Auto Tempest and I didn't really want to, but I knew that there were probably better opportunities out there to get my dream car, which was this. And joy of joys, there was a 2009 Aston Martin DBS for sale by the exact same seller that I got my Vantage from. Thing is, this is more expensive than the Vantage S, despite the Vantage being six years newer. And the reason why is in there. Welcome everyone to the reason why this car is one of the most sought after Aston Martins ever made. This manual transmission is the final manual transmission ever put on a big body Aston Martin with a naturally aspirated V12. Now this six speed manual transmission with this uh, Power Rangers uh, appendage shifter is incredibly rare. They only made 984 examples worldwide and this spec car, they only made 150 examples. I'll get into that spec a little bit later, but I'd like to quickly talk about values. You see that 2015 Aston Martin V12 Vantage S was only worth about $69,000. That's how much I got it for. This car, however, is a lot more. In fact, when we were filming Car Trek in Amelia Island, there was a DBS in the RM auction that I was keeping an eye on and I kind of wanted to buy it until I saw the price. Now that car was also a 2009 with a six speed. It was storm black and it had 8,000 miles. That car went for $135,000 and prices are still going up. This car, although it was very expensive by my standards, it was the cheapest manual DBS in the country, if not the world. Now I traded in my $69,000 V12 Vantage S and I put 30 grand on top. That was a good hit to the bank account, but I got this car for a little less than $100,000. And yes, that is a lot of money, but this car is so worth it. And let me tell you why. Everything in this interior is very premium. There are no cheap plastic components. Everything you see here, this is actual aluminum. This 
Oh, that, that, it feels really good. There's a weight to everything. There's cup holders that are completely useless. However, they have this like solid feel and it just, oh, it feels like a fine watch. Something that had design in mind from the word go. And that is absolutely the case here. Now, none of these buttons make any sense. It really is quite a nightmare to go through anything with the AC or the radio or there's a navigation system here apparently. Okay, that's nice. All I know is this is very beautiful and I love looking at it. It's a great place to be. The seats are amazing. They have this Alcantara insert. I'm not the biggest fan of Alcantara, but honestly, I love how they did it here. It's all over the headliner. It's in the back. This is a true two-seater configuration. It doesn't need some superfluous back seats. This is a grand tour car through and through. I love the carbon fiber touches, carbon fiber up here, down here, but not too much. It's not in your face. It's not all over the center console. This is all piano black. We have the gauges, which have a reverse sweep, which is just amazing. It's a little hard to get used to, but those gauges are so special. They're exactly the same gauges in the Vantage and the DB9 and basically every other Aston Martin made in this era, but I just love them. If you know what the Aston Martin experience is like, especially in this era, nothing comes close to that experience for this kind of money. So if you guys know me or my channel or the way I buy my cars, you'll know that I don't buy these things because I think they'll appreciate. I don't buy them as investments. I only buy what I like, and I usually get them in very, very bad shape. This is actually in really good shape. There's no accidents, has a clean Carfax. It does have a few miles on it, but I like that it's a driver, and I love the spec of this car. But having said that, I do think that this car will appreciate in the future, because as the manual transmission exotic market heats up, people are gonna want cars like this that give them a timeless experience that they could just get in and drive. I think that this car in a few years could reach $200,000 in price. And I'm very happy about that because I could just drive this thing completely guilt-free and then essentially get paid to wait. Now the manual transmission isn't the only thing that sets this thing apart from the DB9 predecessor. There are a lot of little changes that add up to a very, very big one. Now, first off, you have the weight reduction. The DB9 was a pretty heavy car, but this is 200 pounds lighter because most of the front is carbon fiber. In addition, it has this carbon fiber diffuser, has a carbon fiber trunk lid, and a lot of other components are aluminum and lightened to make this thing a little bit more sporty and a little bit more nimble. Another thing you might notice that's different from the DB9 are these rear haunches. The rear quarter panels are very, very shapely, and they're different from the DB9 because they're actually wider. You can see that this doesn't follow the body line of the light. This is very slightly canted outward, and that makes a big difference when you look at the car from the back. I love this styling. Also, you have this raised lip spoiler. They actually did put this in the later model DB9s, but this was the first car to have it. Another key difference between this and the more pedestrian DB9 are these giant floating carbon ceramic brakes. These things are amazing, and it's the first of its kind for Aston Martin. Now, in addition, you'll see that we have carbon fiber accents here. You have these fender vents that are an Aston Martin staple. This is done in polished aluminum. And down here, you'll see that there's some carbon fiber accents, even though this is probably the first thing to hit if you hit a speed bump and this does not have front lift. Now, one of the things I love about this car is that it's just a little bit more aggressive than the regular DB9. You didn't have a ton of scalloped fenders and shark fins just sticking out everywhere. You have these two very subtle vents in addition to the two that were already there from the DB9. And they're there to keep the engine bay cool because this engine, is a work of art. This is one of the last iterations of Aston Martin's awesome naturally aspirated six liter V12. This thing makes 510 horsepower and 420 foot pounds of torque. Honestly, that's enough. Though at the time, this really wasn't in competition with any Ferraris or Lamborghinis at the time, those were all faster than this car, but I don't think that matters because what you get here is something that is completely handmade. In fact, you have a little plaque here that says who made it. In my case, it's final inspection by Mick Freeman. So uh, thanks a lot, Mick Freeman. Uh, hopefully you're watching this video. You made a good engine. But the uniqueness of this car does not end there because Aston Martin is known to do things 
a little bit differently in very, very subtle ways. If you look at the doors, they don't open up normally. They open up at a slight angle to make sure that you don't curb the doors when you open them up on a low car. They're actually called swan doors. If you look in the trunk, you'll see that it's not very spacious, but you'll also see that there is an Aston Martin umbrella. And why you would have an umbrella in the trunk when you have to actually get out and get it, that's sort of uh, counterproductive but it's good that it's there. But one of the weirdest and probably coolest things about this car is the way you start it. And that's with this key. Now this is a sapphire crystal key that Aston Martin call an ECU or emotion control unit. It doesn't clip into anything, into any existing keychains you might have. So this is like a standalone thing. And if you drop it, it's $1,500. Now, truth be told, I didn't actually get one of these with this car. It's actually very common that these go missing when sale time happens because they're kind of cool and they cost a lot of money on the secondhand market. Thankfully, my friend Ed Bullion actually had one of these in his stash of spare keys and he just gave me one and I took my valet key apart, which is just this cheap plastic key that you get to turn on the car and I put the guts into this and it works perfectly fine. That's actually a really good way to get a working key when you don't wanna spend $1,500 going to the dealer and getting a new one. So the way it works is this slides in to the dash, you press it in and then you hold it with a clutch down and then the car starts right up. These have had issues in the past, but I can't imagine that it's any more complicated than a regular keyless go on a Mercedes or anything like that from any other manufacturer. I just think this is thinking outside of the box and I'm glad Aston Martin did it even though they kind of stopped it after these cars became obsolete. Now, having said all of that, there is one thing that you guys are probably thinking to yourselves about, and it does warrant some discussion because this car in this exact spec is what James Bond drove in the movie Casino Royale. This is the Casino Royale James Bond specification, and they only made 150 of these cars worldwide with left-hand drive, black interior, and this paint job, which is called Casino Royale. And I love it. It's a dark gray with a hint of pearl, and there's some purple in it when the light hitches just right. I'm not sure if this makes it any more desirable. I'm not really a huge James Bond fan myself, but the fact that this car was in that movie and also got into the Guinness Book of World Records while in that movie, that makes this car very, very special. Unfortunately, that record was for most rollovers in a car accident. Okay, well, having shown you all of that, I think it's time to take this on a drive and hopefully we don't break that record because that would be very, very uncomfortable. <laughs> on the road, I should probably let you guys in on a little secret. You see, Aston Martin lied to everyone when this car came out. Instead of it being a hardcore track-focused monster, like Aston Martin would have you believe, this car is the best Grand Tour ever made. This is what I'm talking about. So usually what happens with these thoroughbred race prepped cars is that they make them super harsh under normal driving conditions. Aston Martin, they did the complete opposite of that. They saw that the DB9 was good and they said the DBS was gonna be better. This has some of the best suspension I have ever experienced. It has two settings. It has a track mode and a regular mode. Never put it on track mode if you're on the street. It's just gonna ruin your day. But regular mode, it soaks up all the bumps. You don't feel anything in here. I'm not gonna say it's a Rolls Royce, 
But as far as the driving experience goes, it is just sublime. Up to red line, into third. This car is not slow, not in the least. 510 horsepower into that six liter V12. That sounds so glorious. Aston Martin have been using this since the DB7 Vantage in the 90s, and they've refined it over the years to be this absolute powerhouse. Now, this is not the most power you can extract from one of these engines. They did have a 565 horsepower version in the V12 Vantage S. That's the car I had before this. And yes, that was a little bit faster, but from where I'm sitting, you can't really tell. Now that six liter is mated to one of the best transmissions I've ever come across. This is the Graziano six speed that they also put in the Vantage. Now the way this car picks up speed is very linear. It's not cammy. It's, it's not surprising at all. It's very reassuring. It allows you to do things that you really didn't think were possible with a car this big. But one reason why I got this car was because it had some miles on it. It has 31,280 miles as I speak, and I wanted it to be a little bit used. I wanted there to be some use around the shifter. The leather's not exactly perfect. But the reason why is so I can do things like this. <laughs> If I had some dainty, low mileage cream puff, then I'd feel really bad about doing that. But on this car, it's seen some revs. So I feel like it's just doing what it's supposed to do. Another thing I really like are the brakes. Those big, big carbon ceramic brakes are the first that Aston Martin ever put on a car and they got it right, right out of the gate because Mercedes tried to do this with the SLR and later AMGs, and they had an on and off feel. It was basically no braking, and then you get all the braking, and it was very jerky and abrupt. This, you can have great braking in the cold, even better braking in the hot. Say if I want to just stomp on the brakes. Ooh. <laughs> oh boy, okay, my brain almost came out there. Now when I say this car is my ultimate dream car, there are cars that are more expensive. There are cars that are more rare, but this checks all the boxes. This has the most presence that I've ever seen of any car. It has no bad angles, and it puts a smile on my face every single time I drive it. This is an event, and the first time I ever drove my Aston Martin V8 Vantage, it felt like this, but everything is just pumped up to 11. I could drive this thing from coast to coast and not break a sweat. This thing just loves eating miles. It's very reliable. The parts actually aren't that expensive and it's timeless. The looks are timeless. The sound is timeless. And you can actually put some modifications on it to get a little bit more power. Not a ton of power. You're not gonna make a thousand horsepower with some twin turbos, but I don't think you need it. I really don't. Now this car is old enough that it would be considered a modern classic. I know Mr. JWW just got one, and Salamandra's been talking about these cars for quite a while. These are probably the best value that you can get on the supercar market today. They're super rare. They are incredibly fun. They're great to look at. I know I'm just sounding like a broken record here, but this really is one of the best cars I have ever, ever driven, and by a long margin. And yes, Jeremy Clarkson did say that. I don't care, I agree with him. One minor issue with this car is the fact that everything here, everything in the center console is reflective. So if you get that sun ray hitting just right, it can absolutely blind you. Also, this is a metal shift knob, which means that if you leave this car out in the sun, you'll have a scalding hot shift knob to shift your very expensive car. And also, if you leave your car out in the sun, it will have some of the worst shrinkage on the leather because everything is leather up there. So the leather shrinks and mine has shrunk both in the front and the back. So that's not great, but life could be worse, okay? This is very first world problems. And now that we're just cruising, this is what this car loves to do the most. It just 
shuts up and goes. And this is all I want out of a car. You wanna talk saving the manuals? This is how you do it. So that's gonna be it for today's episode. I really thank you for checking this out. This has been a dream come true. In the next episodes on this car, we're gonna be putting it up on the lift and seeing what's wrong with it. I actually haven't put it on a lift yet and I'm a little bit scared. I'm not too scared though. This does look like it's in really, really good shape, at least for the kind of cars I buy. Now, please do go check out Car Trek. It's in the link in the video description below. I love when you guys give me feedback on it, and I'm really excited for you guys to see Car Trek Series 2. You can see a few sneak peeks on my Instagram, also linked in the video description below. Now, before we go, I will say that this car is not like my Mercy or my 675 or like any of the cars back there. This is not a project car. This is most likely gonna be a daily driver of mine for a little bit, and I just wanna drive it as much as humanly possible. But that doesn't mean I'm not gonna modify it. So I do have some mods on the way and I'm really excited for you guys to see what I have in store. So until next time, this is me reminding you guys that on cars like this that are absolute dreams to have in the garage, I mean, just, just look at it. You guys need to build it better and to do that, you need to wrench every day.